Well, thank you, and thanks to all our panelists coming today. As introduced, I'm Caroline de Bossart, director of the Grantham Foundation. We support geothermal, including Project Inner Space, through grant and investment funding. We've seen some amazing leaps in innovation in this space over the last three to five years. Actually deploying these technologies and having next generation geothermal pilots has been an exciting topic of discussion during the sessions here today. As these projects move forward, we continue up the learning curve, opening up the pathway to scale. Yet despite this momentum, there is something keeping promising technologies and companies that want to pilot on the sidelines, a funding gap. Next generation geothermal combines technology risk and infrastructure project development. There's a kind of unique question this poses for financing. This panel is going to explore ways that we may get through the financing challenges the next generation geothermal projects are facing. Joining us today, we have four amazing panelists with different backgrounds. Mark Barnett, partner, Climate and Energy Group Chair at Foley Herg. Michael Johnson, Vice Chairman and Head of the Energy Transition Team at JP Morgan Chase. Michael Campos, Investor at Energy Impact Partners. And Justin Gallegas, Direct Deputy Director for Industrial Innovation, the White House. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if I could ask you all to introduce yourselves and just give a little bit about your background and interest in geothermal. Um, thanks, Cassie. Mark Barnett is uh, with, with Foley Hoag Energy and Climate Group. I've, I've, uh, I've been working in the, the climate sector generally now for, for over 20 years or about 20 years and seen I remember when, when solar power was something that we needed to uh, buy ads to convince people it was actually real and wasn't something that hippies did in the woods. And yet now it's multi-billion dollar, uh, hundreds of billion dollar business every year. And geothermal to me is, is at the beginning of an exciting curve and hopefully we'll come up the curve that much faster. But I, I uh, had a pleasure of working with Project Interspace, super inspired by the companies in this, in this uh, in this sphere and just feel like the, the promise of geothermal, which is why we're all here, is incredibly compelling and, and excited to be part of helping this happen. Uh, Michael Johnson, I'm a vice chair at JP Morgan. Thanks for having me here today. Um, my background going way back is in oil and gas, a reservoir engineer, production engineer. I've been in banking for 30 plus years. I started the energy transition team at JP Morgan five years ago and uh, started to look for subsectors to spend my own time on. Three years ago, I started to focus on um, carbon capture, and in the last three years, we've raised a little over a billion and a half dollars of growth capital for just carbon capture, and about a year ago, I started spending more and more time on geothermal, and um, recently um, advised uh, the lead investor in the, the round on Fervo, and we couldn't be more excited about the future for geothermal. It seemed like for the longest time it was one of those promising things that was on the cusp, and it really feels like it's about to break out now, so we're excited to be here. I'm Michael Campos. Um, I'm here representing Energy Impact Partners. Um, so EIP is an investment firm focused on the energy transition, and I work for our, our Deep Decarbonization Frontier Fund. Um, so my, my backstory with geothermal starts uh, in 2018 when I was at ARPA-E in the Department of Energy. I got very excited about geothermal um, as, a, as a way to decarbonize baseload electricity and utilize the tools and skills of the oil and gas industry. Um, while I was there, I helped get a couple of uh, early grants to companies like Fervo and Quays Energy. Um, moved on to the world of venture capital where at, at my prior firm we invested in um, Zanskar, the geothermal exploration company and their seed round. Um, now, now at EIP we're, we're really bullish on geothermal um, for a bunch of reasons. Um, we haven't made an investment in geothermal at this point, but uh, we remain excited about it uh, to, as a way of decarbonizing electricity in the face of uh, rising electricity demand for the first time in a, in a couple of decades. Um, so, looking forward to the discussion, and I'll leave it there. Thanks to the Interspace organizers for putting on this event. Nice. 
Well, it's lovely to be here with everyone. My name is Justina Gallegos. I'm the Deputy Director of the White House Science and Technology Office. And when we think about everything that we need to build through 2050, um, Secretary Yellen has described that market opportunity as one of about $3 trillion every single year through 2050. And we think that's a really conservative estimate, actually. And so when you look at the full portfolio of technologies that we need to build to meet that 2050 clean energy economy, there are about 38 different sectors that we are thinking about across the clean energy space. And our team is helping uh, deploy the public sector uh, R&D &D dollars in all of those 38 sectors to meet our uh, decarbonized economy goals. Um, so it's a pleasure to be a part of this conversation. We know geothermal will play a critical role, not only in meeting our broader uh, decarb opportunities, but also in our critical near-term clean firm goals. So excited for the discussion. It's a pleasure to have you. Michael Campos, if I can ask you could take us off with a bit of background and context here. Why is there a financing gap for early stage climate technologies to begin with? What's specific about geothermal? And what is needed to close the gap here? Yeah, so big question with a bunch of big questions embedded in it. But uh, I'll start with three basic things. So why, why is there a financing gap in geothermal? Um, the first is that uh, is relatively high upfront capex to get a geothermal project done. It costs a lot of money to drill wells and install surface equipment. Um, the second is that there is binary risk in a geothermal project in the way that there, there, there commonly isn't in something like solar or wind. And then the third thing is that there's a really, historically at least, a long payback time. Um, once you invest all this uh, in all this equipment and all these holes in the ground, you know, it takes upwards of a decade uh, to get paid back for that investment. And that, that makes for a tough uh, financial profile. Um, and it, it flows back upstream into making it hard to invest in geothermal startups who might want to do something a little bit different because the path to get to something proven in the ground requires a lot of capital and uh, a pretty strong stomach. <laughs> so um, um, I guess to, to, you can compare it to both oil and gas and to solar development in that it has uh, a risk profile that looks like oil and gas but a payback time um, and a payback profile that looks a little bit more like solar. Um, so that combination of things has made it um, challenging just theoretically to, to fund. Now, in practice, uh, some geothermal does get funded. You know, there are companies developing geothermal projects, though not very many. Um, um, and so, uh, the, you know, the way that that happens is, uh, uh, you know, there's, uh, the public company Ormat, for example, um, tends to take a pretty conservative approach to only geothermal project types that have been really thoroughly de-risked. Um, so what, what I think it will take to start bridging that gap is really rapid iteration on, on new concepts. And you know, um, one of the prior speakers mentioned, you know, what is the cheapest experiment you can do to prove out a new concept? Um, once we're able to get to a period of rapid iteration in geothermal, um, I think then we'll start to see some, some serious progress. So I'll pause, for there, pause uh, there for now. Would it be accurate to say then that there's a kind of specific financing gap just around this first deployment of technologies that you have the early stage venture and maybe the later larger checks, but this very first deployment is really with the real crunches? I'm sorry, could you repeat the last bit? Yeah, the, the first deployment of any technology, the first time you put the drill in the ground, is that where the real crunches? Yeah, so when, in, in project development, um, the cost really picks up the first time you have to do full-scale drilling. Um, and so uh, that tends to be the part where instead of you know, single-digit millions of dollars to finance uh, early stages of project development or new tool development, you know, it takes tens to hundreds of millions of dollars to really get serious about, about deploying a lot of CapEx. Um, you know, ideally, uh, the geothermal field could get to a place where a lot of that drilling could be financed through debt. Um, but Generally speaking, debt financiers won't invest in a new type of geothermal, which I think is where a place that we all want to get to, again, because of the, the binary risk and the lack of precedent in the field. Um, and so that, that tends to be the, the big pinch point. You have a good idea on paper, and you now need to build something that's real, um, in either in a greenfield setting or um, you know, revitalizing an existing power plant. Now we've got representatives from government and banks and uh, venture investors and, and others in the room. But maybe, Mark, I'll just turn to you first, because uh, I know you've been working with Project Space on novel financing mechanisms. Um, can you just outline some of the approaches and types of solutions, perhaps that exist today, and, and some of those 
that, that don't yet exist, um, but we might look to create. Absolutely, thanks. And you know, building on uh, Michael's excellent typology of geothermal, I think, I think the challenge is to, to attract, in order to really scale, you're gonna need project finance debt, infrastructure equity in this space. And uh, what those types of investors are looking for is they're looking for multiple deployments with you know, ideally tens of thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of operating hours. They're looking for repeatability and that's the type of thing where there's effectively a gap because in, to get to that point, you, you, need, you need a type of capital that's gonna be a little bit more um, patient. I, I was at a, you know, we're all here for Climate Week. I was at an event yesterday where um, somebody, I think very well-meaning and we've probably all had this thought, said the bankers should just take more risk. And uh, I can ask my friend here whether that's gonna happen. And I, I think we all know what the answer to that is and quite frankly, that's not the role of bankers, right? There, there's, there are roles of different players in the ecosystem. And I think that for certain types of risk, um, you know, we think of venture capital as that classic type of capital to, to provide that type of, of risk capital. But once you get to certain scale of projects, you're getting beyond what venture capital is necessarily comfortable with. So I think we really, I, I think you've got a need to really be creative and bring together different types of capital. We've seen catalytic capital play a role certainly in the venture space. My, you know, Michael worked with Prime, I work, do a lot of work with Prime and other groups that have done that. It's a little bit harder at the infrastructure scale, the check sizes are bigger. I think there are some creative ways to do that. We can dig into that a little more. There's also, the government's gonna have to play an, a very important role and does play an important role in doing that. So uh, I guess, I, I, guess I, I just leave it for now with just saying that there, there's a need to bridge a gap between um, for emerging climate tech, it, it just, it, until you, you've got a chicken and egg problem is, is you need the capital um, uh, at a scale that, that is, but the capital, the capital that exists at that type of scale isn't comfortable with the risk. I mean, the last thing I'll say is our, our former, our, our prior uh, session uh, with the former CTO of, of, of Facebook was talking about the the, the, uh, the rise of uh, AI is something that we should, we should celebrate because there's so many large buyers, sophisticated buyers that need more and more electricity. That is going to be one of the other factors here, which is getting bu offtake buyers in the market who really want these things to happen. That's sometimes something in other contexts we've actually seen as a challenge. So uh, we need to bring all the different tools to, to play to really get these projects built. All of our problems would be solved if bankers would only take more risks and just do the things we'd like them to do. Yeah. Um, you and I have spoken before about uh, the kind of interplay between different stakeholders in these projects. Um, bankers are, are one, venture investors are another, project developers a third. Um, could you say anything on the role of in insurance and how that might play into making projects more financeable? Uh, absolutely. I I mean, this is an emergent idea. It's something I would love to hear what other people on the panel think as well. But I think thinking about different ways that, that I mean, that, catal that we can catalyze um, new technology uh, development. And I think one of the things that I think some uh, really smart people have been playing with is the idea of catalytic risk insurance. Is, is there a role that, that technology insurance or some form of insurance products can play, especially if it's backstop by certain types of catalytic capital. We've seen insurance in the solar sector, for example, where I spend a lot of my time, start to play, a, 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 in, in creative ways, play a really important part of the scaling of that industry. For example, we've seen uh, insurance to backstop the credit of commercial industrial off-takers who are not necessarily investment grade to unlock more debt. We've seen insurance for uh, uh, to, to uh, backstop the, the level of production of the solar farms. Uh, we're now seeing some insurance to backstop the credit of tax equity investors that are not necessarily investment grade to unlock the, you know. So, so I, th these are the types of things and we've seen companies like New Energy Risk come in with technology risk insurance in the market. And I, I just think those types of ideas are the kinds of, that we need to be, you know, spaghetti, the proverbial spaghetti we need to be throwing against the wall to really start to try to unlock some of these uh, technologies. Okay, spaghetti against the wall. <laughs> Michael Johnson, um, you've been active in advising entities who are investing in geothermal. Uh, you mentioned your advisory of the lead investor for Fervo. Um, it's awesome to have JP Morgan participating, and it's great to hear the enthusiasm in your introduction. 
what would it take to bring banks to the table to directly finance projects themselves? So, um, it's the simplest answer is, and I tell companies this all the time, good unit economics. Because <laughs> um, geothermal is a lot like a lot of these other industries when you, when you tear it down. And, and just to back up, um, I tell people I live in the valley of death because we don't get involved with companies that are raising 25 or 50 or even $100 million. We get involved when they're raising two or three or $400 when they're ready to scale. That's the hardest growth capital to raise, particularly in today's market. So the first thing it takes is good to be able to demonstrate the prospect of really good unit economics. Because at the end of the day, you know, geothermal company is a power company. They're gonna build a number of power plants. You're gonna have to spend money on each one of those. The good news is, um, you're, you have a product that's valuable. As we heard earlier, the whole AI and data center thing has made it more valuable. You have um, off-takers who want to buy that power. I mean, firm green power is the unicorn right now, right? There's, there's no 24-7 carbon-free power that's available at scale right now. I mean, small modular reactors will come, but probably not in this decade. So geothermal, to the extent we can scale it, is ready. and you can demonstrate good economics. And if you're gonna build, you know, 20 plants, it's harder to get the first one done. We've just been raising equity to do that. You just have to fund those with equity and you have to find investors and there's a, a, a their strategic investors tend to be more risk on right now than financial investors. Um, and that's what we've seen. And once you get those done and then you get the project up and now you're proving that it can run and, and that, you know, it stabilizes at a reasonable place, then you can show the project economics. When you get to that point, we are seeing the capital flow in. And it's really coming in in three levels. It's, it's not quite yet project debt, but that'll come. But, so that's one, project equity, and then top co-equity. And we're actually, I mean, you haven't seen it announced yet, but that capital's forming right now around geothermal. Justina. Just to hear from the, the government side of things, can you tell us more about what the government's doing to advance financing projects and what levers you're able to pull to close the gap in the role that the public sector can play? Sure. Um, well, at the outset, I want to just provide a little bit of context on where geothermal fits in in our broader 2050 clean energy portfolio and the really robust foundation that has been established by our administration to build at speed and scale. And it's a really exciting, I think, inflection point that we find ourselves in. So on the first day of the president's um, term in office, he pledged to restore America's leadership um, globally and here at home. And every day since, the Biden-Harris administration has led and delivered on the most ambitious climate agenda in modern history, including securing the largest ever climate investment and unleashing a clean energy manufacturing boom that has attracted hundreds of billions of dollars in new private sector investment. It has created hundreds of thousands of new clean energy jobs all across our country and lowered in real time energy costs for families all while delivering cleaner air and water for folks here and around the world. And so with these new historic federal investments, we are implementing a new clean energy industrial strategy here in America, one that is tailored to really fit this economic moment, but that also needs to learn from both the success and the failures of the past. And so we are investing public money in both essential areas of the economy, but still letting private markets really do what they do best. That's lowering costs, discovering new technologies, and driving successful business models. And since the start of the administration, we've seen at least, and this is a really conservative investment, $900 billion in new private sector investment in critical sectors across the economy, including over $167 billion in clean power generation alone. And as has been discussed, we know that we need to continue to grow our economy and also meet our energy needs um, while concurrently addressing the climate crisis. And so to meet the president's 2035 decarbonization of the power sector goal, the nation's total electricity generation capacity is going to need to triple. By 2035, our load is probably going to triple. And this load actually reflects our administration's successful reshoring of critical economic sectors and our broader push to electrify while expanding the economy. 
And so when you think of everything from semiconductors to AI data centers, our economic productivity, competitiveness, and national security fundamentally rely on a clean, resilient, and reliable power sector. And when you look at all of the latest models through 2050, we know that um, clean firm, so 24-7 power, is going to make up about a third to potentially up to half of everything we need to build through 2050. And I just want to say that again, because I think it's pretty astonishing and I don't think everyone appreciates that. All of the latest best modeling, both inside and outside government in the US, says that to meet our 2050 goals, we need clean firm, so it's 24-7 clean power, um, that's about 700 to 900 new gigawatts of clean firm power. Um, and I would say that's probably actually a conservative estimate, estimate given how much uh, demand in manufacturing is being reshored. And so we know um, and have uh, acknowledged on behalf of the entire administration, and there's uh, a bunch of leaders here talking about this um, all across uh, this week and beyond, the crucial role that geothermal is going to play in meeting our clean firm needs in real time. And so next-gen geothermal could help close the gap by supplying anywhere from 90. There are some estimates to north of 300 new gigawatts by 2050. That's incredible. And with recent progress, as I'm sure has been mentioned today, by Fervo on flow rates and the new utility-scale contracts with Meta and Sage, there's really an exciting prospect that geothermal could put even more gigawatts on the grid um, than what we originally projected. So to your original question of what is the administration doing to really empower geothermal and meet this moment, we know the power sector, which is responsible for about a quarter of current US emissions, um, now has really unprecedented public sector tools, including new big financial support, more efficient permitting, and long-term regulatory certainty. So I'm gonna to touch on those three pieces very quickly and then would love to continue the discussion. So on the financial side, there are new really big grants from the private, from the public sector that the private sector can take advantage of. So the bipartisan infrastructure law has over $70 million in grants for enhanced geothermal projects. And there's a new $160 million project to support the geode consortium, which I know a lot of folks are tracking. Um, there are also production and manufacturing tax credits in the IRA, which are soon going to be uh, tech neutral, which is really exciting. And these are projected to reduce about 50% of capital costs for geothermal projects. And I just want us to appreciate that. The Inflation Reduction Act, the production tax credits and the manufacturing tax credits that the government um, is making available could reduce costs up to 50% for these projects, which is incredible. Um, and so on permitting, our administration also secured, we know this is a really big challenge, $1 billion to help expedite agency permitting for geothermal. This really means that projects that would have otherwise been on the sidelines are able to now deploy at speed and scale. And we have really recognized the potential of geothermal uh, on federal lands, and I don't think a lot of folks have thought about this. In April, we announced a new categorical exclusion to streamline the process for next-gen geo projects. And this will really enable folks to confirm the resource by drilling new wells, which is projected to shave off about two years of project time. So it's huge time savings. Um, and with these permitting reforms, uh, next-gen geo may be on track to be the fastest, as has been mentioned, source of additional clean firm power available, which is huge. So we are really hoping to tap into this resource as quickly as possible, and we are very excited about the potential here. Um, I just have to mention as well, jobs, we're tracking at least 200,000 people currently in the US who participate in the oil and gas sector, and there's a lot of overlap between the skills necessary in both of these sectors and uh, a really nice transition that could happen between uh, those fields uh, for those workers to participate in the clean energy economy. Thanks. I think talent transfer is a really important point that perhaps we should come back to. Um, and no news to anyone here, but speed and scale seem to be the words of the week at Climate Week. Um, it's fantastic to hear everything the government's doing to support the advent of next generation geothermal. Um, I, I wanted to ask a sort of side question. We're talking a lot about geothermal as a power generation source, which is a very, very big prize. Um, but as we heard in a very memorable musical number earlier today, some of you guys may have caught, uh, obviously geothermal is a great source of heat, 
both for residential and commercial buildings, but also for some industrial uses as well. Um, I wondered if there's anything, you know, I know the Department of Energy has uh, explored cost sharing for lower carbon heating projects. Is there anything coming down the pipeline for geothermal there? Yeah, so I think um, we have described our broader clean energy strategy as public se sector enabled and private sector led. And so I think uh, when you look across the IRA and particularly the production and manufacturing tax credit opportunities, um, we won't necessarily be the ones who are picking winners and losers or determining that level of specificity on the government side. But I would say if there are those types of projects that are of interest, um, certainly would love to continue the conversation with folks on how we could partner. Super. Jumping to a, a bit of talent transfer and thinking about resourcing and, and financing from the company side, um, Mark, how can companies set themselves up here to support project deployment? To support product development? Uh, it's pro project deployment, yeah. Or to make themselves really attractive for financing as they start That's to think right. about putting drill bits in the ground? Yeah. Well, it's a great question. I actually, um, I was just thinking about what Michael uh, well, both Michael, but uh, um, Michael, what you were saying about the growth capital that you see forming, really project equity for these deployments, which to me is fascinating because we're talking about potentially growth capital, pr project growth capital forming for companies to deploy technology that has never been deployed at that scale, which I, I think in some ways you could argue is counter to all of the conventional wisdom of how project finance works. I mean, unless you can kind of analogize enough to what some of these newer, I mean, I obviously don't know which companies you're talking about beyond Fervo. Um, I mean, we can make some guesses. Um, but it's an interesting question to ask, right? I mean, there, there are all of the macro factors that we've all been talking about all day are there in terms of the demand, in terms of there being really no other good, you know, firm green solutions, certainly modular solutions. Um, you know, all of the big companies that have made the net zero climate commitments that have really no other good ways to meet them uh, while they've got rise. So I, I'm curious if it's a, 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 all those macro factors together with the expertise of the oil and gas industry that's really come to bear. Because the last thing I'll say is that what we see a lot in the emerging climate space is that there's sometimes a mismatch in personnel where you've got a technology company that's really good at developing technology and has developed a great new, whatever it is, battery, uh, you know, waste to energy device, whatever it is. But now they're going to deploy those projects and it's a different type of DNA. They don't have the project development DNA. They've got the technology DNA and those are often different types of personnel, different types of skill sets. All of a sudden you're worrying about site control and supply chains and EPC contracts, which is a very different set of things than, you know, IP generation and, and you know, experiments in the lab. And, but I wonder if the geothermal is different in that you're bringing the oil and gas expertise, people who've developed wells and it's not that different. So I've just, that was a very long question and maybe leading, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts because I think that's a fascinating insight you were sharing. So, um just to start out with that, first of all, capital comes in pockets. That's the way we describe it. Pocket of capital that's designed to do this or do this. And capital markets, public and private, have moods. They get moody. They're, they're risk on, they're risk off, and they tend to travel as a herd. So the reason I'm saying all that is that um, over the last, so if you go back to 2021, we had all the stars, stars line up for the perfect capital raising market. We were launching deals and doubling the size of the capital raise for early stage growth companies, right? Climeworks, we launched in 2021. We launched $400 million, we priced $650 million of growth equity for direct air capture, right? Unproven technology. A lot of the equity investors put a lot of money to work I know one fund that put $7 billion to work in 2021. That's all suffering, okay? We, we had a bubble, we had high markets, and now we have low markets. You can just track the, the, you know, the public companies that are in the space, that are near the space, um, you know, hydrogen companies, et cetera, and you can see that they've gone from way up here to way down here. Definitely. So what's happened is the growth equity investors have pulled back in and gone risk off, mm -hmm. and they've found it hard to deploy new capital. But 
in this, at the same time, the infrastructure capital have been raising capital hand over fist, right? Somebody, I won't name names, just raised a $17 billion fund. They need to put money, they want to put money to work in big size. They don't need to shoot for the moon in terms of returns, right. but they don't want to lose money. So it's a, actually a really natural extension for them to say, I want to put money into this new technology, but I need to put it into a project with an offtake contract that I can really diligence the risk and feel comfortable that that's going to get built. So if it goes wrong and the project costs a little more, I still get a baseline return of X. And if it works, I might get 15 or 20 percent. So they're so not going to take development risk. They're not going to take dry hole risk. But once it's proven at a certain level, you know, there, it, it's, there's a spectrum. There's okay. a spectrum of that risk. It's, it's, you, 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 if, once you de-risk it all the way, then it's low return, and then they'll slap money on it, and they're, they're ready to go. This is they within their funds. They have parts of it that they're moving up on the risk curve, mm. and they're taking some risk. And it's back to your question about oil and gas. Yes, geothermal. If you look at any, if you look at hydrogen, ammonia, long duration storage, um, carbon capture, you look at those technologies, we're trying to scale all those. Geothermal has this unusual um, element that it benefits from 15 years of drilling technology improvement. And that, by the way, that 15 years is still going on. I mean, I have a client that's an oil and gas client that two years ago, in one calendar year, improved their capital efficiency by 25%, still. So by drilling better wells, so that's what's going on. So you can imagine, that's why oil and gas companies are thinking about geothermal, because they say, hey, we know we can get better and better and better in drilling a well, which brings down the cost, which brings up what, what I said before, unit economics. So it's not surprising to me that the project equity, and over the last two years, the, the only people that call us and say, can you please find a place to put the money to work are the infrastructure funds. Huh. They really have capital to put to work. Maybe responding to that, if you were a geothermal startup setting out today, Michael, how would you, you, what kind of steps would you take to make yourself attractive to an infrastructure fund when that moment comes? If you're starting up, you, you really have to go to equity. And you're really not going to be able to, you know, infrastructure, that's too early for them and they would tell you that. So if you're starting, but what we are seeing now is a blend where once you get far enough along where you have a pilot project and you prove the technology works and you just need to make it bigger, right? And people are getting to that stage. What we're seeing now is um, infrastructure funds will come in at the project equity, like I described before, and they'll also take some capital and put it at the top cut, right? Which is a really nice alignment of interest because if they, if they take too much of the juice out of the project, there's nothing left for the top cut. So we've seen that repeated a few times recently. And that's well, also, really if they fund the project, they probably figure they want to capture some of the value on that. Exactly. Right. Exactly, yeah. Very interesting. How about um, when you're starting to connect with potential customers and other stakeholders as well? You know, are there things that you should seek in offtake agreements, insurance, whatever? What are the kind of key KPIs you'd want to go after to make yourself really bankable? I didn't hear the last part of that, sorry. Oh, sorry. What are the key things you would want to go after as a, as a new company to make yourself bankable when you're have a, you know, um, nailing down agreements with it, potential customers and other stakeholders? It's um, what you want to do is, and, and I know I'm a, I'm a broken record on this, attractive unit economics. So, so you really, and I can't say it enough, and companies, you know, once you, if you can show that, and so what you want to do is say, I, I'm a startup, I've got a technology, I need to you know, get a little bit of money, and I need to build a small scale, a pilot project, and then I need to be able to convince people that I can go from this scale to this scale and bring the cost down, because that always happens when you scale up, so that I can make money on it. And I want to be able to lock in power sales so that I can de-risk the revenue part, right? Because a lot of times people say, oh, well, once you get a contract, then you're done. Well, that's half the return equation, right? It's cost and it's revenue. So, so you want to lay out that roadmap that says, I've done something small, it's repeatable. If, you're, if your analogy is to the, you know, the oil and gas drilling, then that's, that's useful. Um, here's how I'm going to scale it. And here's the offtake agreement that's going to de-risk it for you. I spoke too soon on speed and scale, and the three words of the day at least. 
attractive unit economics. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Michael Campos, um, just thinking about that, that scaling that Michael Johnson just outlined, you, you've spoken before on the kind of lack of project developers. And this is interesting interplay here. You know, a lot of geothermal companies are tech companies, but they also kind of need to be project developers as well, perhaps to prove out that concept. Could you talk a little bit about that tension? Yeah. So when I first came into the geothermal world, um, I, I thought about wow, this is a really awesome technical opportunity to, to do some crazy things in the subsurface that you know, oil and gas has sort of taught us how to do, and now we can translate it to this other problem, and then you know, we'll, we'll start drilling wells to 300, 350 C and produce lots and lots of geothermal power. Um, it turns out reality is more complicated than that, and in order for a new technology to be deployed anywhere, you have to either sell the technology to a, somebody who's developing a project, or um, go develop it yourself or, or provide a service to a, to a project developer. And so, as, as I mentioned before, there just, in the US at least, there just aren't that many project developers operating in geothermal today. Um, there's maybe like three or four doing, doing serious active development right now. And if, if you're a geothermal technology startup, that really limits your opportunity to, to make sales to anybody. <laughs> um, and so, so that's where I see the biggest bottleneck in the ecosystem, um, a lack of uh, geothermal project developers who have you know, a track record that um, you know, speaks to, to a reduced risk versus somebody just walking off the street and, and starting their own company. Um, um, the geothermal field historically is fairly small, and so it's, it's just not that big a pool of human capital today, although we, we of course have a, a large pool of oil and gas talent sitting right next door. Um, so a lack of project developers who have really um, demonstrated an ability to get, get capital projects done in the subsurface is, is a, a big pitch po pinch point. Um, and then you know, to, the, to, to Michael's point on attractive unit economics, um, one, one of the exciting things that I think this next generation of uh, geothermal startups, both developing tools and developing uh, new reservoir and well designs um, can offer are indeed attractive unit economics if, if fully proven out. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier upfront capex, uh, uh, binary risk, and long payback times. Um, you know, if, if let's say a, a typical geothermal project, you know, if everything goes great, is going to give you a return of nine to twelve percent IRR. Um, you know, that that's fine, but that's not really that's not really that attractive. Um, now, if you are able to uh, drill more cheaply and spend less money up front doing drilling, if you can um, reduce exploration risk by doing either EGS, so you've eliminated dry hole risk, or better identify hydrothermal sites, and then if you can get more power out of the, the hole you've spent all this money drilling, you can reduce your payback times. So there are, there are a couple big levers that, that we're looking at to increase um, project returns uh, and make these admittedly risky projects uh, more, more attractive. Um, and I, you know, I, think, I think the point about getting a share of a top co equity along with a project equity investment is a good one. Um, one of the frameworks that I think about a lot is that a first of a kind project, you know, in geothermal or out of it, in sort of the worst of both worlds, it's both higher risk than a, than a conventional project and the returns are probably worse. <laughs> um, and so uh, getting a share in the top co can be a way to make the, the overall deal more attractive and get something to a close that might not have been able to otherwise. Well, Michael, you can tell your investment committee that growth equity or project equity is waiting, so you, just, you know, <laughs> tell them to approve some of those investments. Yeah. No pressure. We've got some great Project Inner Space t-shirts at the front with different logos. So next time we have this conference, it's going to be attractive unit economics on yeah. every single one of them. <laughs> Justina, could you talk a little bit about some of the market shaping mechanisms that might come into play here? In the carbon removal space, you know, we've seen bodies like Frontier use advanced market commitments to accelerate the deployment of carbon removal technologies. Is there a space for uh, something like that in geothermal? I think there definitely is. That would need to be developed hand in hand with the private sector. But I think when we talk about the unit economics of uh, this clean form source, I think there's a really important moment that we can meet in real time, um, meeting the immediate load growth, particularly driven by AI. We know we are already en route to electrifying everything by 2035, but we are in this moment of unprecedented uptick in load growth in real time. And I think, um, 
one of our former colleagues from the administration, Brian Deese, um, along with some other colleagues, has written really thoughtfully on the additionality principle of pulling forward clean firm by partnering with hyperscalers in real time to pull forward critical clean firm technologies that would also buy down the cost of broader uh, transmission and grid costs um, that might affect ratepayers otherwise. Um, and I would look to the recent deal of Constellation that just came out this week um, and more that will likely be on the horizon like it as sort of uh, the shape of what could happen in real time, both for uh, broader clean firm sources, but also specifically for geothermal. And so thinking about how we can really lean into that moment, both tap government resources, but also uh, create some, I think, really novel, timely, creative partnerships um, with folks who are willing to pay in real time to pull forward this technology. So I think that timeliness is, just presents a, a really unique opportunity that we should uh, partner thoughtfully on and would love to continue that conversation with anyone um, internally or externally uh, outside of government who is excited about uh, partnering on those because we, we are ready to meet this moment and uh, should with clean firm sources. I like the word creative. We've talked about the things that startups need to show, to, you know, the, the discipline of traditional banking and the need to show unit economics and to, to be bankable and, and to be diligenceable. Um, but there's a space for creativity as well to, to support geothermal as it scales. I know we're coming to time here. Um, maybe I'd like to close on a bit of a lightning round. Uh, what advice would each of you have for geothermal players looking to secure strategic investment? This is, I think, the part we haven't spoken about yet, working with, with companies and corporates, perhaps in the oil and gas space or other strategically aligned partners. Um, Michael Johnson? S uh, the strategic capital is some of the best capital out there. Um, y you really have to court the strategics. You have to go explain why your technology uh, not only works, but where it's adjacent to them. What they really want to know is, why would I be any better at this than anybody else? What can I bring to the table? Geothermal, that's an easy one for the oil and gas drilling companies, but there are other technology companies they could also go to. So I think you have to figure out the adjacencies and, and also just let them know what they can bring to bear. Yeah, and I guess for oil and gas companies as well, you're making that case of buy versus build. You know, what we're bringing to you that that is new and different. Justina? Sure, so when we think about geothermal, I would really emphasize the time scale of generation delivery. Um, and so when we think about all the load growth that needs to come online, as has been mentioned, um, and everything that we know that needs to be clean firm, when we're looking at various clean firm sources, uh, would really lean into emphasizing the time frame to delivery for geothermal projects versus something like developing a new SMR or bringing online a new AP1000, which we know we will need, but um, will probably take actually a lot longer than a lot of our geothermal projects. And so I think when we think about this sector, the timeliness and meeting the moment with all the tools we have, meeting that load growth from hyperscalers and leaning into the unprecedented USG resources and uh, all of the private sector uh, interest in financing that opportunity is I think that emphasizing that time scale to delivery is really going to be the differentiating factor probably for geothermal. Fantastic. Maybe Michael and then Mark. Yeah, yeah touching on the strategics. Um, so you know, again, one thing that we do a lot at EIP is work with strategics who, who um, you know, we manage capital on behalf of and in both in geothermal and outside, um, I think you know, two of the biggest questions on my mind with, in terms of how you can work with a strategic and attract strategic investment is really um, what can you do for a strategic that nobody else can and then by that same token what can that strategic do for you that nobody else can. Um, and you know if you look at uh, for example Fervo Energy which has raised quite a bit of capital from Devon Energy. Um, in that case, it, it looks like you know, Devon certainly has quite a bit of operational experience drilling and managing wells and, and uh, hydraulic fracturing campaigns. And then Fervo uh, helps bring Devon's skill set into uh, a decarbonized future. Um, and so that it looks like there's a, a, a pretty good give and take in that relationship. And certainly that's, that's one lesson that goes far beyond geothermal. Um, these are, the only thing I guess I'd add there is, it, you know, a number of years, like five, ten years ago, you saw strategics pretty rarely involved in early stage climate tech investment. We're seeing them much, much more frequently. 
Uh, I, I would say everything that you've heard uh, from my other panelists, I would agree with. I'd also say early, you tend to want to be very careful if you're a startup with a strategic early on. You certainly want to avoid the bear hug where a strategic might have a different incentive for why they're investing in you than a financial. Uh, like, an, like, a, like a venture firm is aligned with the founders in terms of really being mostly focused on creating the most value possible. Strategic sometimes have other concerns, so there's some tricky, thorny issues to manage. It's easier to bring more than one strategic or to bring them in with other financial investors, but it's a, a wonderful trend in climate generally to see so many strategics investing, investing earlier, investing in really thoughtful ways, and I think it's part of why the sector is going to remain strong uh, for a long time to come. It's a great note to end on. Thank you, Mark, Michael, Michael, and Justina. Thank you, Cassie.